Okay, aspiring clinicians, let's take a look at ingrown toning removal with digital block. Here you have your learning objectives. Do use the learning objectives to fine tune and continue to move from being a surface learner to a deep thinker. Good progress, guys. Now, here's an idea of what the lecture will cover. Uh, do note that when we get to gather your supplies, ingrown toenail, there's a separate video that covers the actual procedure. Um, I will probably revisit follow-up care and instructions because on that separate video, I feel like I'm a bit rushed there. So, like every aspect of clinical medicine, knowing your, your anatomy is part of the basic uh, aspect of clinical medicine. Yes. So, if, if, you, if you don't plan on performing um, matrixectomy, uh, then you don't need to protect the, the nail matrix. So what does that statement tell you? Well, if you notice here, you have the nail plate. And if you look over here, you have something called the germinal matrix. So that statement is directly related to the germinal matrix, right? The germinal matrix is that part that actually produces a nail, right? So, so again, the nail matrix is that proximal portion, right, of the nail bed from which grow mainly well, which the nail grows actually from, right? So therefore, if you destroy it, then you can permanently prevent the nail from regrowing. So it kind of extends approximately six mm under the proximal nail fold, right? Here's a proximal nail fold. And kind of like the distal portion is visible. You know it as that white spot on the nail, right? That white semi semicircular lunula, right? There it is, right? So if you should take something that is sharp, electrical and you actually damage this area right through the nail plate you can actually hit someone's matrix and prevent the nail from, from developing further something as you should know is that there is something called the cuticle right the cuticle which is the edge immediately covering the base of the, the fingernail you need to also know that sometimes they use the word cuticle and epilichium interchangeably which is the thin skin covering the epidermis at the base of the nails of course, I told you about germinal matrix. There's something called the hyponychium, which is right out here, right? The edge at which the, the fingertip and the nail plate comes together. That's the hyponychium. Okay, and then there's eponychium. If you go right back, you hit the, the eponychium. Okay. And of course, we, we discussed the little bit. Okay, so here's a deeper look at the anatomy of the digit. If you notice, the digit is here. Overlying the digit, you have the nail plate. You have the proximal nail, right? Okay, and then you have the hyponychium, which is all the way out here. And again, if you look at E, you know that's the nail bed. And if you think about F is, F is basically the periosteum. That's the bone, kind of a bone form in the outer bone. So, moving forward, we know our part. So let's look at what risk factors are involved. So genetic predisposition plays a part, right? And Poor fitting, excessive trimming, trauma, and to, main, to name many others. But what you should know is that ingrown toner usually occurs in the big toe, but it can affect any of the lesser toes. And they mostly, they're most frequently seen in adolescents and young adults, but they can be a common problem of all ages. They occur in people who, who have pincer nail deformity, which is an excessive curvature and distortion of the nail. Okay. So look out for that in your patient. So talking about risk factors, it is also a good idea to know how to touch your, your nail. The correct method of trimming toenails. If you look over here to your left, notice uh, there is a picture showing you of a short, rounded, or V-shape. Those are improper cuts. A proper cut is a cross. The, the image on your right, if you look at D, this is the way you should actually cut the nails, OK? right? So you want health promotion and prevention, cut the nail straight across, that should be the aim. It's important to understand stages of ingrown toenails because depending on the stages, like any aspect of clinical medicine, this, the treatment may differ. For instance, you have stage one, stage two, stage three of ingrown toenails. If you notice, pressure, pain and pressure, first stage, superation, superation is basically pus that flows, that you just don't have pus, it's flowing, it's draining. Right? Marker of infection. Stage three, there's already granulation tissue, embolization, 
at stage three, this is when you tend to do excessive work when you're doing surgery, you have to trim away the granulation tissue. Granulation tissue is just tissue that has increased rich blood supplies, right? So that is something you should bear in mind. Okay, skipping that. Rationale. Why do we want to do this procedure? Well, we want to diminish pain. We want to, to prevent or relieve abscess formation. We want to promote healing and we want to prevent to and repose. Yes? When it comes to indications, uh, of course, for us, the main thing is in bone toenail, but there are other, other reasons why you, you want to do this procedure, include cases where you have chronic recurrent inflammation of the toe of the nail fold, like paranychia. Contraindications, you know, as a, as a clinician, you should take careful history, and then it can reveal systemic diseases. What are we talking about? Diabetes, vascular disease, blood dyscrasia, vascular collagen disease like scleroderma, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's, right? So th those are, are conditions uh, that may be, may be relative contraindications, and you have to wait on a case-by-case -case basis, right? Maybe what you need to do is, you know, don't use it, <clears throat> avoid using, uh, pay attention to the amount of anesthesia you use, avoid using tight hemostasis because the person already has vascular disease, case with diabetes. So there are certain uh, steps you can take when someone has like a vascular disease, right? Because you, you don't want to reduce blood flow to the digits. Right? So again, when surgery is necessary in these folks, you want to avoid epinephrine in the anesthetic, right? Because you, you, you should know that anesthetics in the digits, you tend not to use epinephrine. But that is an older belief, but we'll stick to the older belief. And diabetic patients with neuropathic disease should not have natural septomy for blood. And you should also pay, to the, pay attention to the contraindication for the niche of blood. Potential complications, of course, pain is the most common complication following nail surgery. Most pain occurs within the first 24 to 48 hours. Many complications can develop, right? Infection is another one. And periostitis, for instance, is not a complication, which is inflammation of the inflammatory reaction around the periosteum. If you're using phenolization, meaning you're trying to kill the matrix with chemical, you can get chemical burn. The supplies are addressed in a separate video. So are the procedures here, right? So this is the first part of the procedure. We introduce yourself to the patient. You, you pay attention to the nerve block. You pay attention to the fact that you draw up with one needle, then you switch to a 27 to 30 inch, or even a 25 to 30 gauge needle for the actual procedure. It's a three-sided ring block followed by removal process of the whatever portion of the nail plate that needs to be removed. Here's an image showing you how you can actually do a three-sided ring block. You have a lateral approach. You have approach across the dorsal aspect of the hallux over the tendon of the hallux it's longest. And then you have, so you have a medial approach, another medial approach, but in a horizontal direction. Then you have a lateral approach in the first in the space, but Notice, all the approaches are distal to the MTB. Okay, and then when it comes to local anesthetic, we use local anesthetic without anesthesia. To tell you the truth, the the the, uh, the, the recent knowledge out there suggests that you can put in healthy patients, you can use anesthesia, and physicians in North America have been using it, uh, epinephrine in surgeries that involve finger toes, penis, outer ear, and tip of the nose, all right? But for our purposes, for academic medicine, we continue to preach, we stick with tradition, say do not use epinephrine in these areas. And of course, after you apply the anesthetic, you wait five, probably 10 to 15 minutes in some cases, ask the patient if they feel pain, okay? That's important. And of course, just, Give you a look, you for the procedure again a, a nail elevator. You would like to separate the nail plate from the nail bed, right? 
uh, you continue to separate it all the way. That's of course after, after you apply anesthesia and you wait to make sure it has taken its effect. Then you want to cut it all the way from the hyponychium, the jaws in the region of the cuticle, the hyponychium, right? Uh, where they, but without damaging the, the, the matrix, then of course you take the hemostat, grab the lateral aspect of the nail in the jaws of the hemostat, and then you turn away from the ingrown portion of the toenail. If you notice, you turn away this way, right? And then you pull it straight back after you separate it. And then you make sure that there are no spicules, for example, right? No spicules that remain because if it does, it can cause repeated inflammation, which will follow by infection and even recall. And of course, if you are, if it's maybe a second visit, usually a first visit, you just want to do a toenail removal without killing the matrix. But if it's a second visit, or if it's a more severe form, remember there's stage one, two, and three. Let's say it's a stage three of ingrown toenail, then you can do a matrixectomy. Most common one used is phenol. Here's an example of phenol being applied to kill the matrix. Usually three applications over a period of one minute each separate application and you change the cotton applicator every time you apply the phenol and avoid having phenol drip on any part of the tissue because phenol is an acid and it can inflame the tissue okay to follow up here remember you, you want to have the patient change the dress in 12 to 12, 24 hours after surgery not immediate after surgery so in the following days you want to change the dressing maybe one to two times a day and basically the idea is that the dressing will help to pat and protect the wound and it can also absorb any drainage from the wound and then you can replace the bandage if blood is or fluid kind of soaks up the bandage and you want to keep the wound um, bandage for at least one week after surgery or as long as there's any soreness or drainage from the toe you can let the toe remain uncovered at night um, especially in the second week because this helps the wound heal. For pain relief, um, to swelling and inflammation, you want to soak the foot, have the patient soak the, the foot in warm water or Epsom salts, Epsom salts or even table salt, one to two teaspoons of quart of warm water for 10 to 15 minutes every day after the surgery for about two weeks. So the patient may shower uh, one day, right, 24 hours after, after uh, replacing, uh, actually a after shower, shower can replace for soaking, right, in the first, first day after surgery. And then you want them to gently dry the area and apply antibiotic ointment, triple antibiotic will do, or whatever um, the organization working with prescribes. And then you want to keep the wound clean and dry, except, except when showering or cleaning the area. So remember, pain is, 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 the, is a common problem, right? So another way to control pain after the procedure is elevation of the foot, usually above the level of the heart of the affected, of the affected foot for 28 to 48 hours. Or you can apply size packs for 10 minutes to the dorsal aspect of the foot. Or you can take painkillers like ibuprofen, 600 milligrams, you know, stuff like you know, Nuprin, Motrin, Advil every eight hours, or acetaminophen, Alanol, 325 milligrams every four hours. So following all sorts, so you want to follow all sorts with, again, with petrolatum or triple antibiotic or any prescribed medication twice daily until the wound is completely healed. And you don't want to be wearing, you want to advise the patient the type of shoes to wear. You want to want them to wear open toed shoes, loose fitting shoes, or even sneakers, not tight sneakers, loose fitting sneakers for the first uh, two weeks after the procedure. You want to avoid wearing high heel right, or high fitted shoes in the future and tight fitting shoes in the future as well. And if you're a very, very active person, you want to avoid running, jumping, doing strenuous activities for about up to two weeks after the surgery. In case of teenagers, they should not participate in physical education for about one to two weeks after the procedure. Another thing you may notice is, you know, after surgery, there may be a small amount of clear yellow or pink fluid that will drain from the wound for the first uh, 10 to, uh, 10 days or so, that's kind of normal, right? Once it's not smelling. And if the infection develops in toe, the first few weeks after surgery, you want to call your clinician's office um, if you develop any increased pain, swelling, redness, drainage from the toe. And again, trimming the nails straight across, 
the top of the nail, best way to prevent another ingrown toenail from developing. And it must not be cut into the corners or picked at or torn off. And you need to develop another. Well, actually, if they do, you look at that patient where they may develop another ingrown toenail. And ingrown toenail surgeries are usually painful. That's why the anesthesia part of it is, is very important. Right? Um, they, we, in this position, you do a three ring, three sided toe ring block. Uh, some clinicians actually do an extra injection horizontally across the dorsal side of the foot, in addition to the three injections, just because it's very important to achieve anesthesia in some patients who are difficult to achieve anesthesia. Okay, let's change gears and discuss the supplies. Let us begin by looking at what we'll need for the procedure. So what will we need? So we'll need syringe, a five to 10 ml syringe should do the job. And we'll need needles. So we need a needle for drawing up and we'll need a needle for administering the anesthetic. So for drawing up, you can use an 18 to 22 gauge needle. Um, this here is a 23, close enough. And you can use a 27 or a 25 to 30 gauge needle for the actual injection. And of course, you'll also need your anesthetic, and they usually come in vials that look something like this. Besides that, for the, for the disinfection, you can use provodone iodine, which is here. Here's a sample of it here. Or you can actually use alcohol. Right? You can actually use alcohol swap to clean the digits of the toe. And here is our module, so you can use it to clean the digits. And of course, you'll also need cotton wool applicators. And the cotton wool applicators, let's say this is a second visit of the patient for toenail avulsion. Usually the first visit, you don't remove all of the nail. You don't remove any of the nail. Um, it's if there's a recurrence, you tend to do a matricectomy. So you'll need to apply phenol to the sulcus of the lateral side of the nail, either side that has the problem. Sometimes, depending on the, the stage of ingrown toenail, there are three stages of inflammation. By the time you get to the third stage, you already need to get rid of granulation tissue. So you can use a curret to get it done. And this is what a curret looks like. Um, besides that, you have your cotton wool, right? That can also help you. Um, maintain a bloodless feel if you're doing matrixectomy. You have your 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 gauge, your gauge, which you can actually just wrap the toe when you are finishing up the procedure. Of course, you have what you call a drape, a sterile drape, if needed. You can place the patient's foot on the sterile drape. Of course, you need non-sterile gloves, and sometimes, sometimes the patients may need to have their, um, the matrix killed or removed so that th there is no recurrence, you can use a tourniquet or a Penrose drain. Um, now, to get to the instrument, you will need a nail elevator. Okay, and I'm just gonna pause to make sure we have that in focus. Uh, this can also do the job as well. It's similar to a nail elevator, right? You can actually get in there in, in the proximal areas of the nail onto the cuticle to separate it from the nail plate. We have here a nipper, a nail nipper. Um, probably a nail splitter is preferred, but this nipper will just do fine. And of course, you also need a hemostat. Well, this is not quite a hemostat. If you notice, the jaws are kind of shorter, right? They're kind of like forceps, but they'll do the job. Um, what else do we need to focus on? Um, I think that's about it. So having said that, let's transition to the next stage of this video and we'll talk about the actual procedure. Okay, let us transition to the actual procedure, in which case we'll do the procedure. In addition to that, of course, we need to do the three-sided ring or toe block. And it's a block of the big toe or the helix, or the hallux, sorry. So what do we need to do? We need to introduce ourselves to the patient. We need to make sure we have the right patient that we are focusing on the right side of the foot, right? If it's the right foot or left foot, and it's the big toe or the hallux. And you need to get a patient's date of birth. You need to check for allergies. And you need to inform the patient 
meaning you need to obtain informed consent and explain the procedure to the patient. So what are some of the things you need to do? You need to let the patient know of the indications, right? Um, what indications are there? Okay, you have an ingrown toenail, maybe you have paronychia, um, maybe you have a fungus that, is, that has damaged nail, you need to remove that section of the nail that is no longer healthy. Or you can go on to explain the risk and benefits. And of course, you need to explain alternative procedures. And of course, you also need to explain possible complications. Contraindications, you need to explain that. Vascular disease is the top of the line. And with that, diabetes is one of the contraindications. Um, very common contraindication. Now, after you've done that part, what do you need to do is proceed to gather your equipment and basically if you gather your supplies, we've also already gone through that video, so you gather your supplies. After you gather your supplies, you want to position the patient. So let's say this is the foot of the patient. Just imagine, I know I just have one digit, but that will do the job. You wanna make sure that the digit, let's say if this was my sterile drape, I wanna make sure the digit is actually flat on the surface of the drape, all right? And when you've carried out the procedure, your dominant hand will stabilize the toe. And you'll doing, when you're doing north block, you'll use your dominant hand to perform the north block. Now, let me explain a little bit more about positioning the patient. So you can have the patient in the dorsal recumbent position. Basically, when they're in the dorsal recumbent position, their feet can st will still be on a flat surface, right? Or you can actually have them sitting up with their feet dangling off the side of the exam table. But in that case, you will need to stabilize their digit even more. It's your preference. Okay. Having said that, what do we need to do? So we need to wash our hands, put on our gloves, and I guess I can go ahead and put on my gloves. And so there's no awkward silence. I'll just keep talking. So I'm putting on my gloves. So what are you, how are you guys doing? You guys doing all right? I trust you guys are doing fine because you don't want any awkward moments when you're with your patient. So you can keep talking to the patient because, you know, fear and anxiety is one of the drawbacks from doing these operations. Okay, so now I have my glove on. What do I do next? I position the patient, right? So the patient is already there. I have my supplies, right? So what is the first thing I do? So let me choose here as the position that I'll choose to have the patient's feet, right? So what is it that I do first? First, I need to do a block. So it's called a three-sided ring block. So I'll take the, the syringe, I'll actually draw up, and I'll just actually, I wouldn't demonstrate this part, I'll just actually verbalize it. I'll actually draw up the anesthesia with the drawing up needle, and you draw up with a 18 to 22 inch gauge. Hopefully I'm in the right focus. 18 to 22 should, should get it done. Um, when, you when you're changing over, Right, you should make sure you shoot the needle, then you can do the switch over, and you should change over to the, the one that you'll actually do the procedure with, right? which is the 25 to, to 30 gauge needle. And the reason why you go up higher um, is because you don't want to cause pain. Smaller aperture, less pain when you deliver it. Okay, so now that I'm performing the the block, remember it's a three-sided ring, three -sided ring block. So non-dominant hand, you want to position the patient. But before you do that, you want to take chlorhexidine. They're, they're, what's in here are basically swabs, but they're coated in chlorhexidine. Sorry, they're coated in iodine, uh, powdered iodine, or you can use chlorhexidine. And you, what you want to do is disinfect the toe properly, okay? Just disinfect the toe. Mainly that is done to eliminate chances of infection, right? So that's what you would do. So basically, you already have your syringe filled with anesthetic, and usually one to two ml on either side of the toe should be sufficient for the anesthesia. So you begin the, the nerve block by, you wanna use your non-dominant hand to stabilize the toe, and then you enter the skin on the medial aspect of the toe, but distal to the MTP joint, meaning you're roughly at the level of the interspace, 
all right, which would be on the lateral side of the toe. So you enter, and as you enter, you pa basically want to tell the patient, you may feel a, a little bit of a sting and then a bit of a pain, and then you enter the needle from dorsal to plantar, but make sure the needle doesn't pierce through on the other side, all right? And as you inject, the, before you inject the anesthesia, you want to aspirate because you want to make sure you're not within a vessel, all right? You never, you never inject into a vessel. So as you withdraw the needle, you inject roughly about one to two ml of anesthesia. But as you withdraw and as you withdraw and as you inject, you come out to tip, but you don't let the needle leave the skin. Sometimes you do, but that's not a problem, but you try not to. Then you reorient the needle after you reach the tip and then you inject now across the tendon of the hallux, right? Hallux is longus tendon. And then you inject from medial to lateral. And you inject, once again, be sure not to pierce the skin, okay? So after that, you withdraw the needle. And this time, you're going to go over to the lateral side of the toe, which will be this side, right? Meaning the first interspace. And again, you inject by orienting the needle perpendicular to the lateral aspect of the big toe and distal to the MTP. And then you inject once again, and you do it in a similar manner, right? You inject, make sure that you don't pierce or go through the other side, that is the plantar side. And as you withdraw, you inject the anesthesia. The belief is that the expanding fluid in the tissues will not be as painful. And that's how you complete the, the North block. You want to sheet your needle, and if you have a di disposable container, you dispose of your needle there. So basically, you have your nerve block. So after you've done your nerve block, what you need to do, or what you could do, is just snap one of these after five to 10 minutes. Snap one of these. You get a sharp edge. You wait five to 10 minutes. Most patients probably need 10 minutes. Some maybe even need 15 minutes, right? And then you test for sensation. And you ask the patient, do you feel any pain? The answer you're looking for is no, all right? So you can prick various parts of the patient's toe, right? And make sure that there is no pain, right? The answer you're looking for is no, okay? So you prick all over, not just where the, the region where the inflammation is, but all over to make sure that the patient, because what you're really anesthetizing, there, there are two groups of nerves that run on either side. And you're basically anesthetizing what is proximal to the nail. You're not really anesthetizing here. If you anesthetize up here, what is distal will be affected. So that's your, your aim. Okay, so I haven't done that. You're asking, what should I do with my 10 to 15 minutes? Well, you can go see another patient, um, and then you can come back to your, your patient. So now you proceed to the procedure. Didn't mean to do some alliteration there, but it just happened. So you take your elevator, right? Your nail elevator. Hope I have it in focus here. You, you use your non-dominant hand and you choose the lateral nail plate, the lateral nail plate of interest, and you go under the nail plate and you separate it from the nail bed, right? By now the patient shouldn't have any, shouldn't have any, uh, shouldn't be feeling any pain and you separate it away from the nail bed. You go right back, so that's on a need. Above you can also separate it, you can go from the hyponychium, which is the edge of the nail, all the way back and separate it at the level of the cuticle. So after you've done that, what you proceed to do is cut the lateral one fourth to one fifth of the nail plate. Again, position, the, make sure that your non-dominant hand is positioned in the nail. In your case, you will not actually cut our model. We would like to keep using our model, but you can just verbalize it. So you cut the one foot to one fifth and you just make one cut. But as you cut, you should feel a give because you're moving from high density tissue, which is, the nail, which is your nail, just underneath the cuticle or the eponychium, that's not a name for a cuticle, and you'll feel a give. So you cut it, all right? And after you've done that, you're almost there, okay? You can then take the hemostat, again, we t we're gonna believe this is a hemostat, and then you grasp as much of that lateral portion of the nail get as much into the jaw of the instrument, and you twist 
But when you twist, you twist away from the ingrown toenail portion, all right? You twist away from it, all right, and twirl, and then pull backwards, okay? Now, after you've done that, there should be a new sulcus that's created in where the nail used to be. Now, you want to examine, let's say this is the nail, right? Let's say this is the nail. You want to examine the nail to make sure that there's no part that remains in this proximal sulcus. Because if there is, what you need to do is go back in there, not only with the elevator, but also you should have a scissors, and that should allow you to clean out this area, okay? Because if any part remains, it can cause inflammation, which can lead to infection, and you don't want recurrence of this problem. So after you've done that, what you need to do is basically um, wrap it up, so to speak, right? You want to... Actually, there's something I need to explain. Let's say this is a patient who's coming in the second time who has stage 3 inflammation and you need to do phenolization. Basically, you would actually take, let me use the one that I already kind of destroyed. You'd actually remove much of the edge of the cotton here. You remove much of it and fashion, okay, that shouldn't happen, but it happened. Let me see if I can get this done quickly. You remove this and just need a paucity of cotton wool and refashion it. And let's say this was my phenol bottle. I'd actually dip this in the phenol and make sure when I remove it, it's not dripping because you don't want this acid to get on any part of the tube but that sulcus. So your, your intent is to destroy the matrix. You're doing a matrixectomy. You would go in there and apply it. You kind of like twirl it the way people twirl their, their, um, when they're trying to get wax out of their ear. I know that's not the best image, right? But that's the way you do it. You do it for 60 seconds for tr three times, right? For so a total of three minutes, but separately. And that should be enough to kill the matrix, all right? So after that, you get topical antibiotics, and you apply the topical antibiotics to the area of the toe that has the nail removed. And then after that, what you would actually do is get your your gauze and you'd actually wrap it right but you don't you don't try to wrap it tightly okay you wrap the gauze around you want to make sure that if you you have water resistant tape to actually then tape it off all right so you don't make it too bulky but then you can use water resistant tape to actually hold it there and then you can have the patient follow up in a few days um, another thing I wanted to explain is that if you're doing fin if you're doing fin uh, phenolization as a as a method for matrixectomy, you can actually use a pen hose drain, or you can just create a tourniquet, tourniquet, right, by twisting it like this. And if this was a hemostat, right, you would want to hold it in place to create to create a bloodless feel for operation. The reason why is because blood inactivates your phenol. Okay, and after that, you put away, you get rid of all your waste, all your the materials that you have used, put it in its appropriate container, take off your glove, wash your hands. Then you can now proceed to do follow-up care and instructions. So what do you want to tell the patient? So after their surgical intervention, they should consider a follow-up in three to four days to assess treatment, and you really would like to exclude skin infections, such as cellulitis, right? You want to look to see that they're, if they are sterile exudates, well, that's fine. It's sterile, and it, it may persist for several weeks, but once it's not infected, that's not an issue. You will want to elevate the foot, right, for the first 12 to 24 hours. Um, if you do phenolization, pain should be absent, and there should be minimal pain if you do radiofrequency uh, matrixectomy. You know, if the patient asks you about pain, of course, you can use NSAIDs if there are no contraindications, and you want to change the dressings 24 hours and wash with soap and water. And you want to do it at what? At least daily for one to two weeks following the procedure. Then you want to apply petroleum until there is proper healing. And you can always tell the patient to call if they find any signs of inflammation. Of course, you know, if there's pain, if there's swelling, 
And if the exudate is infected, meaning it's beginning to smell, all right, um, they should be able to have normal ambulation, all right, after a couple of days. And of course, talk to them about patient education, proper nail care. Uh, teach them to cut the nails straight across um, and not to make a, uh, you know, acute curves in the nail. That can just cause them to have repeated issues. Talk to them about proper foot care. Talk to them about not wearing tight shoes. In some cases, ingrown toenail happens to be of genetic predisposition. There's nothing much you can do. But of course, if they follow these, these bits of advice, they shouldn't have recurrence of the problem. Thank you.